Uh, thank you, Pete. Um, it's my pleasure to be standing here uh, with the, the last of the presentations for this particular session, and, and really it enables me to stand on the shoulders of the, my giants with the science that's uh, gone into this particular study and present the stuff that, that half the room really wants to know. They want to know about what happened in the matches, so I get the glory at the end, which is good for me. Um, I, I will skip over some of my introductory slides because this has been covered uh, ad nauseum, I think, now. Uh, I colour coordinated mine to match the corporate colours though, so I get some extra brownie points for that. Uh, as we've discussed over the last uh, day or so, we, we know that there's a linear decrease in VO2 max with um, ascent to altitude. Uh, we also know um, from the first study I actually got to work with Pete, which was, which was great for me, that this decrease in VO2 max is matched by uh, pretty much a linear decrease in power output, so this was in a five um, minute time trial performance. Uh, we know a little bit more about what happens when you take um, footballers to altitude. So this is a study that uh, we hope will be published very shortly. It's just uh, undergoing some minor revisions, probably about, uh, I don't know, 3 a.m. I think uh, I'll get onto these if I can't sleep on the plane tonight. Uh, so this, this is a study where we actually took uh, the Australian under 20 uh, guys to Denver for a pre-altitude camp before they went on to play in the Youth World Cup. And, and I won't go into too much detail with this. I'll, I'll try and get to the, um, the data that we've got from Bolivia, but their total distance uh, in metres per minute was reduced at day four and also at day six of altitude. So even 1,600 metres of altitude was enough to affect this. Uh, their low velocity running, uh, interestingly, was also reduced at day, six, uh, day four and day six. High velocity running, which we describe as anything above 15 kilometres per hour or 4.17 metres per second, if you prefer, uh, ex again expressed in minutes relative to game time was reduced day four and day six but their capacity to perform uh, multiple maximal accelerations uh, which uh, we define as greater than 2.78 meters per second squared or 10 kilometer per hour change in speed per second uh, was not altered uh, with with uh, this low altitude of Denver so there, there were some some things which had us a little bit intrigued as to what would actually happen when we took the guys to, or a different cohort of course, but we took a group to a much, much higher altitude. Um, another uh, way that we can look at our data is that, uh, and this is a, a little bit confusing at first glance, but what we do is we use a rolling five minute sample period to identify the peak five minute period in any match. And this is the peak five minute distance shown up the top here. Uh, and then we're able to look at the five minutes after the peak period. Okay, so you're all with me, so it's not uh, just zero to five minutes, five to 10 minutes, 10 to 15, but it's that we identify the peak five minute period with a rolling average that we employ and then look at what happens in the five minutes after that. So as well as looking at performance with the peak period, well, we can get an idea of um, transient fatigue in matches. Uh, we prefer the rolling method because it, um, it seems that we get a gross underestimation of the peak period if you just use predefined periods. Uh, so what we can see here, and, and again, I'll, I'll go through this reasonably quickly, uh, is that there was around about a 15% decrement in the subsequent five minute period for, for total distance um, at sea level, but this was much greater uh, at day four and day six of altitude in our Denver study. Uh, the same is true for high velocity running. Uh, and we, we did actually identify that um, even though our overall number of maximal accelerations was not altered at altitude, that uh, the peak maximal accelerations in five minutes and also the subsequent uh, part to that, there was a greater reduction. So we knew a fair bit of what to expect uh, in, in uh, a group of young soccer players going to, to altitude. Uh, as Alice presented yesterday, we know that uh, at 2,000 and 3,000 metres, there can be a reduction in overall work in simulated team sport running. We know that there's a, a, a gradual deoxygenation of muscle uh, when doing that team sport simulate or simulated team sport running at 2,000 and 3,000 metres. Uh, and we also know that there's a possibility that teams will have to play um, football matches at altitude, and these can be in various places around the world. Um, I tested my colleagues, and I can happily say that they were able to answer uh, as to which countries they were. So if any of you can work that out, there'll be a prize later on today. Um, we've been through this, so I'll, I'll just skip over this again. Uh, so we're interested, as has been mentioned, in uh, not just sea level athletes going to altitude, but of course what happens with altitude natives coming to sea level. Um, we've also heard that some teams try and fly under the altitude radar. Uh, I don't think that's going to work very well. 
And there's some real gaps in the knowledge. So what happens to the activity profile? So that's the, the term that I use to describe the, the running or the movement of players in matches. Uh, I don't like movement demands because I don't think we actually ever know the demands. We only know the output of players. So I much prefer activity profile. Um, so if any of you are writing papers, please put that in because if I review it, I might ask you to anyway. Um, and the stats that Martin has uh, very nicely described as well. So we don't know what happens with high altitude natives coming to uh, compete at sea level to their activity profile in games. We don't know the effects of high altitude on sea level natives going to, to altitude. And we don't know the time course either. So although we've had some snippets of information, uh, that's been at low altitude, so 1,600 metres, uh, but we don't know really nothing about what happens in games. So the GPS technology helps us answer that question. Uh, I won't go through this in any detail other than to say that I'm going to concentrate just on the matches, which of course was really the reason we designed the study in the first place, was uh, to get an idea of what happens in the matches. Uh, and then it went to committee and we kept adding some things on. Uh, and there's plenty more to come, I should say, that's not going to be presented today. There's a whole lot of work in progress still. Um, so the, the method, as I mentioned, is uh, we use 10 hertz GPS uh, devices, so Catapult uh, V4 units. We use that rolling average to identify the peak five minute period for both total distance and high velocity running distance. And we then looked at the decrement in each of those measures in the subsequent five minute period. Uh, and we use magnitude-based inferences, of course, as you all would for this particular type of uh, research. It's going to get a little bit busy as to the information that I've got now, uh, but what, what I'm going to show you here uh, is I'm, I'm going to look at the differences between the two teams first and then look at what happened um, in, in each team as, uh, as we played these different games. So uh, a little bit different to what's been there, but uh, the S is the strongest. Okay, so they are the altitude natives uh, in this case, and the J is the Joeys. So the S uh, in, the, in the green and the Joeys in the white, uh, just so you can um, have a look at what's happening here. Uh, and this is the, the peak five minute distance for the two sea level games that I'm showing you here. Uh, interestingly, the, the uh, Joeys were, uh, there was a moderate reduction in, uh, or sorry, moderate difference in the peak five minute period between the Joeys uh, and the strongest in that very first game. Uh, and I can only just imagine what the feeling must have been of the uh, researchers who were there when they scored in the first uh, 30 seconds. Probably thought, oh no, three years of planning and we're going to lose 12 nil every game. But anyway, um, but there was no difference by game two, uh, which was really, really intriguing. There was you know, a substantial difference in game one, but no difference in the peak five minute running in game two. Uh, if we continue along, and now I've added in uh, the games at altitude, so game three, four and five, which were played at altitude. Uh, for each of these uh, games, there was a difference between uh, the, the two teams. Uh, there was a large difference in game three. Uh, the, the Bolivians were, were better equipped to uh, maintain their, their running, if you like, or their, their distance that they ran in the peak five minute period. So a large effect into a moderate difference here. Uh, and this one is interesting. So this is only the total distance though. Okay, which doesn't tell us a lot about the quality of running. But by game five, uh, the Joeys actually uh, had, had a small increase uh, or small, um, slightly higher uh, amount of peak. I'm getting really tangled with that. It was higher in the Joeys in game five than it was uh, for the Bolivian team. Uh, whether that means that they've um, become adapted or not, I think is open to interpretation. But uh, again, I don't think total distance gives us a great measure and a great feel for the type of running which was done. Sorry, skip through too far. So what I've got now is I've got, um, this is purely what's happened to the altitude team, okay? So this is the altitude team compared to an average of the sea level games uh, for, the, for, for the altitude matches. And, and there was a moderate uh, reduction in the peak five minute distance for the altitude team in game three and game four, so the first of the two altitude games, but a, a large reduction compared to sea level uh, by the last game at altitude. And, and I'm not sure if, if potentially that's um, related to the training information that Martin has just presented. So their perception of training was, was quite low, I, I would say, uh, while they were at altitude. So whether that was uh, matched in the, their physical output in those training sessions or not, I'm not sure. Um, and there was even a, you know, a further reduction from game four to game five in this group, just a small reduction. So they, they tended to, to start really well in terms of the peak five minute distance and it really was plateauing in this particular group. 
Uh, if we look now at what happened with uh, the sea level natives, the joeys, um, their response was reasonably stable, I suppose, and there was a moderate um, reduction in their peak five minute distance from sea level for each of the altitude games. Uh, so this is uh, the information on that period uh, subsequent to the peak period. So this is now looking at, uh, I guess it's a measure of transient fatigue uh, in these groups. So I'll start uh, over here with the strongest. And there was only really a trivial change by, gay five, by game five in their decrement in running performance uh, compared to their peak period. So really not much going on. Uh, whilst their, their peak five minute distance was reducing, the decrement in that was not really changing over the time. Uh, the Joeys was an interesting response because uh, we've got down here at sea level uh, is nearly a, a 40 percent decrement in their peak five minute distance uh, at sea level. But when we go to the first of the altitude games and even the second of the altitude games, they had less decrement. Okay, so they had less five or peak five minute running, but they had less decrement in that as well, uh, which to me enables me to introduce the wonderful uh, concept of pacing in team sport athletes uh, and that maybe they were more effective at pacing their peak five minute uh, period and therefore didn't have as much uh, decrement and that will no doubt open a can of worms. Uh, so now we just move on, so in the same format now, but this time with the high velocity running peak five minute period, okay? So uh, this is running, again, above 15 kilometres per hour. Uh, and in both the sea level games, uh, the, the Joeys had less uh, high velocity running in the peak five minute period uh, than the Bolivians. And that was maintained through game three and game four, but there was no difference by game five. Okay, so I think we can suggest that um, there was some sort of adaptation occurring. And again, that may have been related to the type of training and the, the intensity of training, the volume of training being undertaken by uh, the Joeys compared to the strongest. If we shift now to, to what happened uh, in the Bolivians compared to sea level, uh, they had uh, a moderate reduction in their peak high velocity running period uh, in each of the games at altitude. Uh, the Joeys, on the other hand, had a large reduction in the first of the altitude games, uh, moderate and a moderate reduction. So even though there's a trend here for this to be increasing by game five, it is still reduced from what was happening at sea level. Uh, again, if we look at the decrement, okay, so this is the, the decrement in the high velocity running, so the subsequent five minute period. We'll start with the strongest once again. So really, um, a large decrement, as you would expect, because we're now looking at some of the harder running that these type of athletes can do. So some sustained higher velocity running, you would expect uh, larger decrements than you would for total distance. Um, so no difference for the uh, Bolivians in the first of the altitude games compared to sea level, but then a moderate reduction in game four and game five compared to sea level. So again, it suggests to me that there was some fatigue developing uh, in the Bolivians during this particular camp uh, and that's a feeling from me looking at this data, I suppose. Uh, if we look now at the Joeys, uh, for each of the games at altitude, um, there was a greater decrement in their um, subsequent five minute period for high velocity running, uh, which was a moderate decrement uh, in game three, large in game four, and, and back to a moderate in game five compared to sea level. So we're seeing some mixed responses in terms of the activity profile <coughs> of, of these players. I guess the beauty of our study compared to a lot of others is that we've got the same teams playing each other uh, each time. So we can uh, be relatively confident that the changes that we're seeing um, are real changes in their physical performance rather than things which might be the, the tactics or the strategy of one team compared to another. Uh, so just to try and bring all of this together, I I'm not sure if jet lag is the correct term uh, from what we're seeing here, but uh, the Joeys did have um, 30 hours of long haul travel with a nine hour time zone change uh, and they played on day three uh, after, after that travel. So there's a significant uh, amount of fatigue induced by that. So whether it's jet lag or just fatigue, I'm not sure. Uh, 12 days of acclimatisation was insufficient to overcome the effects of altitude. Um, so we've seen that in some of the, the, the physiological measures, we've seen that in the sleep measures, uh, and we're seeing it in the activity profile of these athletes as well. So whilst they were getting closer by 12 days, it was still insufficient to, to return to, to where they were at sea level. Uh, and 
this one, I'm not completely convinced myself, I have to say, but it's possible that because the hypoxic stimulus was so great for the sea level athletes, uh, that they might have been more effective at um, assimilating that stimulus into the activity profile that they actually had. So there might have been a greater effect on them than, uh, than the Bolivians for, oh my God, this is really hard, I'm going to back it off. Whether that's conscious or not, of course, is another story as well. Uh, acknowledgements, of course, for all of the organisations, uh, the players, etc. But especially for Chris Gore, Pete Borden and Walter Schmidt, uh, who really put uh, an enormous amount of effort uh, into getting this to where it was. And uh, hopefully you've seen that we've managed to pull off something that many other groups have tried and failed. Uh, and we're really proud of, of the study. And it's largely down to the, to the work of my colleagues and our relationships that uh, we were successful in. As I said, there's a whole lot more data still to come. We've got a, a lot more uh, physiological measures to complete, so watch this space. Thank you.